the most exciting use cases for streaming. He spoke at the last summit, and we're excited to have him back to give us an update as a keynote this year. All right, thank you very much, uh, Andy. It's really exciting and a real honor to, uh, to be here and to tell you guys about what we are doing uh, using Spark to understand the brain. So I am a neuroscientist, and that means I want to understand how the brain works. And what I'm showing here is a sort of abstract diagram for what the brain is. Basically, the brain is everything in between the stimuli in the outside world and the behaviors that you're capable of making. The brain consists of a bunch of neurons, like these little nodes here. They all have different functions, and they're connected to each other in a variety of complicated ways. So I think you'd agree that in order to understand a system as complicated as the brain, we would like to be able to really look at all of this simultaneously. We want to look at the activity of every neuron while animals have uh, visual experiences, for example, and perform behaviors. And due to some very exciting recent advances in technology, this is really for the first time becoming possible. Um, so one of those advances is actually not a technology, but it's an organism. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, a very special animal, the larval zebrafish. I'm showing here a, a larval zebrafish. They're a little scary looking. Uh, the two big black spots are the eyes. And what's special about this animal is that it's almost entirely transparent. And what that means is that with a special kind of microscope, we can actually see into its brain, and we genetically engineer these animals so that they have proteins that uh, light up when their neurons are active. So the combination of these tools lets us really look in and see activity throughout this animal's brain. So the setup looks like this. We've got a little zebrafish. He's in a little Petri dish. And we're using a special kind of microscope called a light sheet microscope to measure activity across its brain. While he's in this setup, we present him with stimuli, these moving bars that are moving underneath him. And we're simultaneously recording uh, his intention to swim in the form of electrical recordings from his tail. And all of this experimental work is done uh, in collaboration with a really fantastic group of Misha Arens uh, and all the people that I'm showing, showing here. So this is what uh, neural activity across the entire brain of a, of a behaving animal looks like. I'm showing here uh, in red changes in uh, calcium activity, which is our reporter for neural activity. So all the bright flashes indicate uh, neurons going off. All those little circles, each of those is an individual neuron. We're actually looking at a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional volume. So you're seeing really activity across the entire brain. In the upper left is the stimulus that we're presenting to the animal. It's this pattern that moves every 20 seconds. And what I think you'll appreciate in the form of that little circle, which is the animal's swimming, is that every time the stimulus comes on, he tries to swim. We're picking up on that. And you see this dynamic swath of activity across the brain. And there's lots of interesting stuff going on. Uh, so we really, in this animal, are looking at the entire brain during visual stimulation and behavior. So this is incredible. But the next question is, what do we do uh, with this data? How do we understand this data? And there are a couple challenges. Uh, the first is that these data are sort of legitimately getting very, very large very quickly. Uh, to give you some numbers, a comparable kind of method in the mouse, which is, of course, not transparent, so we can't look at the whole brain at once, uh, we only look at a small window, that gives data sets that are about 0.1 terabytes per experiment. The kind of data I was just showing you from the zebrafish that's like one terabyte per experiment, so one terabyte per fish, basically. And looking ahead into the future, if uh, and we hope it becomes possible to do this kind of thing, say, across the entire mouse brain, then we'd be looking at about 100 terabytes per experiment. And of course, we don't just do one animal. We do these experiments in many animals. So very quickly, neuroscience is entering a regime in which our data sets are becoming uh, quite large. Now, what are these data, uh, sort of in, in practice? Really, fundamentally, these are giant, complicated time series data. Because we're recording the activity, essentially, of every neuron or every neural signal, and that activity varies over time. So our challenge is really to take these big, complicated time series data and find structure in them. And there are a couple different ways of how to do that, or a couple different things you can think about doing with time series data. So there's simple stuff like just taking every neural signal and, for example, using regression to fit some simple model or to compute some summary statistic. But we also want to do things that look across the population. 
like dimensionality reduction and clustering. And of course, the, the sort of fun part of analytics is that these kinds of simple things are really just the beginning. Once you start to explore data, there are all different kinds of things that you might like to try. So in our case, we're constantly developing new analyses and new algorithms to try to uncover different kinds of patterns and structure in these data. All right, so these are really our two challenges, that our neural data is getting large and it's complicated. Um, and in thinking about a sort of platform for doing analytics on these data, there's really kind of three main things that we need. Uh, one, of course, is speed, because we want to process these data quickly. We need flexibility, because we're constantly developing all these new algorithms. And we need interactivity, because we never know ahead of time what the right analysis is going to be, so we have to kind of figure it out by playing with the data. So these are the things we need. Uh, and of course, the reason uh, we're here, I'm here, is that Spark is really the perfect tool for doing exactly this kind of work. Um, we started using it a, a little over a year ago, and it really has just been a fantastic uh, platform to build on for doing these kinds of analyses. Um, and that's really what I'm going to be showing you today. Uh, we, in particular, have been developing a library, which we call Thunder, which uh, implements a family of analyses for finding structure in both spatial and temporal data. Um, the library is entirely open source, um, so I encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's written in Python, but we're working on porting at least some of the algorithms where useful back uh, into MLlib, so we can give that back to the, to the community. Um, and I want to highlight here both a bunch of the things that we have implemented as well as things that we're in the process of implementing, as well as some of the people that have contributed or are in the process of contributing to this library. All right, so that's all about the technology, but really what I want to show you is how we're using this to understand uh, the brain and find structure in these neural data. So I want to walk through an example of an experiment. What we're doing here is measuring neural activity across the fish's brain while presenting, uh, in this case, stimuli that are moving in different directions. All right, we want to know how are neurons tuned to these different directions and how is that organized across the brain. So this is what the raw data looks like. In the upper left, again, is a stimulus. This is what we're showing the fish. And in bright red, we're seeing patterns of neural activity. Uh, to orient you, on the far right is the front of the animal. And in the far left is the back, his tail. And what I think you'll appreciate just looking at the movie is that every time the stimulus comes up, there's a big swath of activity. And there's also a relationship between the stimulus that was presented and the particular pattern of activity. But that relationship might not be immediately obvious, so we need to do some kind of analysis to figure it out. Uh, and in this case, one of the analyses that we can do very quickly in Spark is just to look at every neural signal independently and ask which direction of, of the stimulus motion did that neuron respond the most to. And when we do that analysis, we get a kind of map shown here. So the color code, every single pixel is colored on the basis of its preference for a particular direction of motion. Which motion did it respond the most to? And what this gives us is a visualization of the organization of tuning in two direction across the entire brain of this animal. And we see, for example, there are regions where uh, activity and preferences are very heterogeneous, and then there are areas where things are much more coarse scale. Um, so this actually says something very deep about the organization of the representation of this stimulus attribute across this animal's brain. This, what I'm showing here, is just a two-dimensional projection. We can also, uh, we are doing this in 3D so that we can really see the complete three-dimensional organization of preferences uh, to direction across this animal's brain. Um, so these kinds of analyses are, are important and they're powerful, but they're doing one thing that's a bit limited, which is they're just looking at each neuron independently. What we really want to go after is an understanding of the joint structure of the response of an entire neural population and the joint dynamics. So again, these data are, are time series data. We have the time series of response of every neuron. And one of the challenges to understanding the joint structure of a large collection of time series is that it's really hard to look at uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of time series simultaneously and to understand their structure. Um, one strategy we can use is dimensionality reduction where instead of looking at lots and lots of time series, we can project them into a low-dimensional uh, embedding or a low-dimensional space uh, using things, for example, like PCA, which many of you are probably familiar with. Now, one of the limitations of that kind of method is that uh, it's very hard, typically, to take into account what you might think of as context, the fact that at every moment in time, something different was happening. In our particular case, at different moments in time, there was a different stimulus presented. But you can imagine all other kinds of time series data where there's lots of contextual effects of what was happening at that 
moment in time during the day, for example. And you want to be able to take these things into account when you do this sort of dimensionality reduction and look for structure in these time series data. So uh, we and, and several others in neuroscience are working on uh, what we sort of collectively call targeted dimensionality reduction. And the idea is to do dimensionality reduction in a way that takes into account these kinds of contextual effects. Um, and the particular work I'll show is in a collaboration with uh, a couple really cool dudes at Columbia, uh, Jeff and John. So what we can do is take these kinds of time series data and decompose it into different low dimensional spaces that capture different kinds of structure in the data. So I'm going to show you the first space that we recover for these particular data. The way to think about this movie is that every single trace represents the activity of the entire brain after a single presentation of the stimulus. And as we watch the movie, we're watching the activity of the brain evolve through time. And the traces are colored based on the direction of the stimulus that was presented on that trial. So what I'm showing here on the left is a low dimensional embedding where we're watching the evolution and the dynamics of neural activity in a space that was found to capture variability related to those different directions. But with the exact same data set, we can recover a very different low dimensional embedding, the one shown on the right, and this one was found to capture dynamics that were common across all of these directions. So what we're looking at here, it's kind of cool, we're looking at the exact same data set, but through two totally different lenses. These are two three-dimensional projections of a very high-dimensional space. And although that sounds very abstract, the sort of concrete thing that we're really seeing here is that there are aspects of the neural dynamics that are very clearly related to the different directions, but then there are also aspects of the dynamics that are common across all directions and really reflect the underlying uh, sort of dynamics of the neural population. To make that even more clear, if I, instead of coloring these traces based on the direction, color them based on time as it evolves uh, from the stimulus onset, we now see that what was ordered on the left becomes chaotic and what was unordered on the right now becomes very clear. The last cool thing about this kind of analysis is that we can take these low dimensional embeddings and bring them back to the brain to look at spatial organization. And that's what I'm showing here. So in the upper right is another map of the fish brain, this time without the front of the brain. We didn't cut it off, it just wasn't included in the imaging volume, um, <laughs> just in case anyone was concerned. Uh, so what this visualization is showing us, it's identifying every pixel and coloring every pixel on the basis of its low dimensional embedding, which is further visualized in the lower left in a scatter plot. And the sort of simple observation is that different points in this space correspond to different temporal profiles of activity following the onset of a stimulus. So the green areas, for example, respond as soon as the stimulus comes on, whereas the light blue areas are delayed. Um, so we're seeing sort of the organization of temporal profiles across the brain. Um, now, one thing to say about this kind of analysis is that uh, we're doing it for the most part now uh, all using uh, Python and also in the IPython notebook, and we've been building some kind of interactive visualizations with D3 so that we can kind of explore it and, and look at these data on the fly. One of our goals is really to make kind of large-scale neuroscience available to the entire neuroscience community. Um, so I was, of course, extremely excited by what we saw from Databricks Cloud yesterday because I think that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to let any neuroscience researcher uh, basically fire up a cluster and start playing around with these data. So I'm really excited about the potential there. Um, we've also been negotiating with Amazon to uh, host some of these data sets publicly. That will be uh, more details on that soon uh, to really let anyone come in and start playing around and find sort of collaboratively find structure in these data. All right, so everything I've been talking about is sort of analytics, correlative analytics, which is what a lot of analytics is. But uh, there are some unique opportunities working in neuroscience to not just correlate activity of the brain, but actually go in and manipulate it. Um, I guess that's also a little bit like that Facebook experiment. Um, but we're doing that by targeting individual neurons. It's also totally approved. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> what, uh, what's been developed in neuroscience recently is a lot of very exciting technologies that let us manipulate neural activity uh, in a very targeted fashion. So this includes things like being able to control the stimulus on the fly, as well as decode neural activity on the fly. But we can also use light to activate or inactivate neurons, and we can uh, use lasers to ablate neurons. So to show you a, a demo of one of these things, which is ablation, I want to highlight uh, one of my collaborators, Simon Perone, who's been developing a very high throughput way of, of ablating neurons very quickly. Um, so what we're showing here 
is uh, a bunch of neurons that he randomly selected in a given imaging plane, and he's parking a two-photon laser beam right above each one, uh, and by holding it there for a little bit, it ablates or kills the neuron in that location. Uh, at the very beginning, you see there's this little flash of light uh, when each pink dot turns yellow. Um, once that dies out, that's sort of an initial shock. Um, once that dies out, the neurons are, in fact, uh, killed, and that's why they remain bright. Um, Simon's been doing some really cool work trying to speed this up, and we're up to about, I think at this point, maybe about 400 neurons an hour um, that he can kill, so that's our throughput. Um, and this is a very powerful uh, way to really go in and start manipulating and targeting the brain. So all of these technologies are, are coming online, and you can kind of think of them as like APIs for plugging into the brain, but what's missing or has been missing is a way to do this in a functionally targeted way. So we have all of these manipulations and we want to be able to target them to particular neurons based on their functional, uh, functional properties. We want to know what are the blue neurons, what are the red neurons, so that we can go in and do these manipulations in a targeted way. And that's really for us where Spark Streaming comes in. Um, because Spark Streaming is what we're using to expose the brain and to expose the functional properties of neurons in order to do these manipulations in a targeted way. Um, so our basic pipeline uh, looks a lot like other maybe Spark Streaming pipelines. Uh, the ingestion is coming from the brain, and uh, at every moment in time, we're collecting a pattern of neural data, and that's getting immediately transferred to our cluster uh, into a D-stream, and then we're developing a family of streaming algorithms that essentially update uh, models for individual neurons over time um, by using a, a combination of, of our own libraries as well as some of the algorithms in MLlib. And I want to thank uh, both Deep and also TD who are helpful in sort of our developing these algorithms and developing the infrastructure. All right, I want to give you just a couple examples of what these streaming uh, algorithms and streaming analyses look like. So in this particular case, we're looking at uh, the zebrafish brain, and we're doing an online k-means analysis, which is letting us uncover, uh, based on their temporal response profiles, a sort of grouping or organization of neurons into different categories. Um, and we're doing this within a little uh, a sort of D3-based visualization that lets us go in and select individual neurons and then do that kind of ablation uh, that I was showing before. These experiments are very much ongoing. Um, one observation, uh, sort of the most general observation so far, is that it's possible to, in a functionally targeted way, uh, destroy a, a surprisingly large number of neurons and still have very little or very subtle effects on an animal's behavior, which we think says something very kind of deep and profound about the resiliency um, or sort of uh, redundancy of neural systems. Um, so this is work in the fish and this is ongoing. But what I'm excited to, uh, to end with uh, today and share with you is some very recent work trying to do uh, this exact same kind of thing in the mouse. So this is a collaboration with uh, Nick Sofenru and uh, Carl Sabota, and they've developed a really cool uh, preparation, a really cool setup in which we are measuring neural activity in a mouse while the mouse is running on a ball and exploring a virtual maze. So this virtual maze is created through walls, little plastic walls that are on motors, and they move back and forth. And for the mouse, this simulates the experience of running through a virtual environment. Uh, and the mice really like doing this. You drop them in, they do it right away. It's very natural for them to explore mazes. Um, and it is, they really like it. And um, they are able to explore this environment and simultaneous to this, we can be measuring neural activity. Now, obviously, just looking at it, the mouse brain is not transparent, and it will be a long time before it is, uh, if ever. Um, there are some issues with doing that. So uh, we can only instead look at a small fraction of the brain at once. Um, it turns out in this particular animal, there are actually neurons that are selective or tuned to the position of the wall, and we think this is very important information that the mouse uses to navigate its environment. We want to be able to characterize that over as large a scale as possible, and this is actually something that Spark Streaming is making possible, and I just want to show you uh, how we're doing that. So again, the, the basic problem is that we can only look at a small part of the brain at once. We can do that in a very small region at high resolution, or a very large region at coarse resolution. Because with Spark Streaming, we can generate maps of neural activity on the fly, we can use that to target our actually, you know, the actual recording that we're doing. So for example, we can start with a very coarse field of view. Uh, try again. Okay, we can start with a very coarse field of view, 
and set up Spark Streaming to be doing an analysis, this is something TD helped us with, um, that in this case is trying to estimate at every location the preference of that response to different wall positions. So blue are wall positions that are close to the animal, and red are positions that are far away. So as soon as we plant the imaging window, we can start recording, and the animal is doing the behavior, and we can immediately get this live update of what the neural responses are looking like. All right, after having done that, we can now say, let's investigate a subregion in more detail, and then zoom in on that subregion, and again, start, Spark Streaming starts running right away and gives us this live update or this live map of the functional response properties of that part of the brain. So what we're really doing is using Spark Streaming to turn the microscope into a sort of live functional window on what the brain is doing. And with this combination of technologies, we think we can start to really sort of map out uh, uh, large and in some uh, ways unexplored regions of the mouse brain during this kind of rich behavior. And then of course, ultimately go in and do those same kinds of manipulations that I was describing before. So I just wanna end uh, by saying that I really think uh, Spark is an incredibly exciting platform for bringing uh, large-scale neuroscience into the future. Um, and it's been exciting to share uh, our work as, as well as work with the Spark community. Um, and I just wanna thank everybody involved. It's really been a big team effort between biologists and systems engineers and uh, system administrators and all kinds of people. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Very exciting. Next up, we have uh, the Databricks application spotlight. And to present that, we have Arslan. All right, I'll just use this one for now. So Databricks announced a couple of months ago that uh, something we called the Certified on Spark program. And one of our major goals at Databricks has always been how do you drive adoption and you know, growth uh, of the ecosystem. And so Certified on Spark was a set of applications that I looked at saying they were compatible, they built on uh, Apache Spark, and they leveraged it to drive either new things for an existing product or products that were uh, built from scratch. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do here uh, in a short session was uh, spotlight a couple of applications that were part of the program. Uh, unfortunately, we have a short amount of time, so we couldn't get everybody in here, but we have uh, four different uh, companies today. So we'll have Zoom data, we will have uh, Alpine, uh, Alpine Labs or Alpine Data, TypeSafe, and Adital as well. And so the main format will be that we'll invite them up here to do a couple minute demo. Many of them also have talks that you can see broader. And then we'll sit down and have a quick chat to understand the lessons from, uh, that they learned building on top of Spark as well as what would they like to see coming out of Spark in the next year as well. So first, uh, we'd like to invite Zoom Data uh, up here, which is Farzad as well as Justin via robot. 